Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled Model Apartments, Experimental Domestic Cells by Gustavo Gili Galfetti, published in 1997 by Editorial Gustavo Gili. Collective housing, although it accounts for a very significant percentage of the architect's work and is one of the most widespread constructions in our urban landscape, tends, in the main, to be one of the most conservative and homogeneous types of architectural production. The static nature of the housing available on the market is due in large part to the economic factors which condition it. Housing is a consumer good, it is a merchandise architecture subject to rules of marketing. In houses, then, only those characteristics are included which will attract buyers and facilitate sales. It is, perhaps, one of the consumer goods that responds to one of our most basic needs, a roof over one's head, while being at the same time one of the biggest investments in a person's life. The buying of a house is a matter not only of present but also of potential and thus uncertain needs as well as constituting a major financial commitment. A whole series of factors that are largely independent of the architecture itself, such as the location, the neighborhood, the terms of purchase, etc., may effectively determine the choice of a home. The spatial richness of the house itself tends to be a factor of secondary importance. Historically, collective housing, as distinct from the villa or townhouse, was classified in the category of construction rather than that of architecture. It was something vernacular constructed by unknown master builders. The modern movement effected a break with that traditional view. Architects began to design collective housing and, more importantly, to argue about it. The entry of the architect into the creation of mass-produced housing brought with it a lack of contact with the ultimate users of the architecture. In order to overcome this difficulty, the artifice of the average standard man was invented. From this point on, the architect would work for a fictitious program of requirements put forward by the developer, private or public, and based on statistical data. In the property market, this absence of a real client gives rise to a series of postulates and assumptions with regard to how people want to live, which represent an impediment to the evolution of the domestic sphere. In the field of housing, it is important to make a clear distinction between the individualized private house and collective housing. There are numerous examples of experimental private houses in which the special symbiotic relationship between architect and client has resulted in parodic pieces in the history of domestic architecture. The work an architect does for a private client whose domestic dreams he makes reality is radically different from the solution produced for the fictitious and intangible standard family derived from statistics, which are often obsolete in relation to the dynamic evolution of society. The same situation can be seen in the world of fashion, where haute couture can encompass research, innovation, stridency and polemic, while pret a porter tied to production lines and sales, must focus on efficiency in terms of a palpable reality, often at the expense of all those aspects that make fashion design an avant-garde creative act. The limited opportunities for experimentation in collective housing are in many cases reduced to those aspects not comprised within the domestic interior. The interior space, the domestic cell, is the space par excellence. It is the space that is constructed for, it is the beginning and the end of construction. It might be worth noting here that the term architecture of interiors is a tautology, given that, by definition, it is not possible to conceive of an architecture that is not at the same time interior. 
The domestic interior is itself precisely the consumer good that is bought and sold, and thus any innovation which endangers the effectiveness of that interior must be excluded from its strict domain. The heart, then, is untouchable. In the majority of cases, it is only certain aspects, such as the various forms of grouping of the units or the treatment of communal spaces, such as stairs and vestibules, or epidermic aspects, such as the facade, which are susceptible to a degree of cautious experimentation, at least for certain more sophisticated types of resident. Accordingly, a very essential strand of conservatism has to be reckoned with. It is interesting to note the paradoxical fact that people who may be inclined to appreciate a certain modernity in their working environment will not accept it in their domestic space or will confine that modernity to the children's room while firmly excluding it from the living room. In such cases, conservatism is securely situated in the heart, in the place where people live their lives, while modernity is peripheral. So, although the domestic interior is the essence of collective housing, in the majority of cases this is a banal and illiterate space. The publication of images of interiors on art paper is largely confined to the tailored-made, personalized projects, usually the work of interior designers or decorators, in which the attention is focused on the complementary details rather than the space itself. Very little attention has been devoted to publicizing the interiors of collective housing in relation to the proliferation of images of the interior as someone's house, as a portrait or three-dimensional representation of the owner or, at least, the decorator. This reflects the widespread fascination with other people's private lives and, as such, amounts to an act of voyeurism in which the private is made public, highly characteristic of our media age. This fascination with all things private should not be confused with the interest in the evolution and proliferation of certain ways of living. The evolution of the domestic cell is intimately bound up with the evolution of lifestyles. And given that social conditions are much more dynamic and flexible than the relatively stagnant property sector, the continual testing of the relevance and validity of existing social models is of vital importance to developers, politicians and architects as the people professionally involved in the definition of new modes of habitation. The question of whether it is domestic habits which shape uh, the environment or the environment which changes ways of living need not be discussed here. But what seems quite evident is that the housing market today, based on the most part on a stereotypical standard family, bears very little relation to the plurality of an urban reality that is characterized by the constant influx of new population with different languages and cultures, by the current diversity of social groupings, by the rapid development of computer technologies that have revolutionized not only our working lives but our domestic habits and by a far less stable employment situation, among many other factors. Nonetheless, with this generally sad and grey residential panorama, there exist a series of cases which have transformed the domestic cell into one of the outstanding areas of architectural experimentation of recent years. These are proposals for new models of housing created out of a commitment to respond to the new ways of living, questioning the present and attempting to foresee the future. The coordinates within which these exceptional cases are produced are equally exceptional in their own right, almost always reflecting special circumstances quite remote from everyday reality. If we set out to examine the most representative examples of these experimental domestic cells, we quickly see that many of them are directly associated with trade fairs, exhibitions, art galleries, museums, publications or competitions. The media, in the broadest sense of the term, have provided the catalyst for many of the most innovative interiors. 
from the time of the first great international expositions around the turn of the century, which constituted the massive encounter between society and material culture, the fundamental motive which has drawn people to visit such events in their millions has remained the same, the search for an image of the society of the future. To ensure the media success of these proposals, directed at a very broad public, it was necessary for the expressions to be less abstract than the drawings and the models normally used by architects to present their schemes to other members of the profession. A number of one-to-one -one scale prototypes were constructed as manifestos of the shape of things to come. What they provide is potential images, real, palpable and three-dimensional, of a domestic imaginary. These prototypes serve as authentic shortcuts between the fantastic and unquantifiable dimension of utopia and the tangibility of real objects. Ask for the Bucatier Local Bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.